Okay, 1.1, nice and easy to start off with. We're asked for a phase difference, for two waves that are destructively interfering. In other words, they are in antiphase or outer phase. So that means the phase difference must be pi radians or 180 degrees. Why is the minimum reading not zero? Well, very unlikely that you're going to have your two waves being exactly the same amplitude. One will probably be like this, one will be like this. So waves will not have the same amplitude. 1.3, we're being asked how we could make sure that our measurement is parallel to the marked line. So as per usual, when it comes to measuring anything as far away from another thing, we use a set square with a ruler to measure x. So if this is our dotted line, and that's where our reflector is. We have a ruler, and then we could have a set square. With that, to make sure that the ruler is perpendicular to the dotted line. And we could also do it the other way around to make sure the reflector is perpendicular to the ruler as well. If we do that both times, we'll find that these two lines will be parallel to each other. So we're drawing two lines of worst fit highest and lowest possible gradients that go through all of the error bars. And we expect G max to be about 0.032 and G min to be around 0.025. So we've been asked to find out lambda. We've been asked to find the gradient for a reason. The gradient according to what's on the axes is equal to all of that nonsense for X squared plus Y squared divided by N. If we take our original equation, if we do y equals mx plus c, we know that this is our y, this is our mx, so therefore y has to be our y-intercept. So therefore, the gradient is gonna be equal to lambda. So lambda is gonna be equal to the mean gradient, so we just have to do an average of our two values. Okay, technically I should say mean, but we don't really do any other type in physics. That gives us 0 0.02, 8, 5. However, because we're in paper three, we need to be especially careful when it comes to number of sig figs. We can see on the y-axis we have, well, four sig figs actually. On the x-axis we have two sig figs. So we need to give our answer to two sig figs. So 0 0.029. Percentage uncertainty in lambda? Well, we need to do one of our values, take away the mean, Let's go for the worst case scenario, shall we? So let's use the 0 0.025. Take away 0 0.029, doesn't matter which way around we do it, and then we divide that by our average. So that's gonna be equal to 0 0.004 divided by 0 0.029. That gives us 13.8%, but we're going to say 14% because let's stick to two sig figs. So how do we find y? We know that for any straight line graph, y equals mx plus c. But in our case, it is, well, our y is this. That's n lambda plus y. So y is our y-intercept in this case. And that's what we're looking for. And that's all we have to do. We already have the gradient and we have a line. So therefore, we just pick a point, put numbers in, rearrange for y. Not an easy question, this one. What's going to happen to g max, g min, lambda and y. So we're asked what would happen if this one was omitted from the results. Well, g max actually wouldn't be affected because our line isn't touching the top of the error bar. G min on the other hand, well, it is touching the bottom of the error bar. So therefore, if we got rid of 13, that means we could go even lower. So therefore, g min is gonna be reduced. If the minimum gradient is going to be reduced, then the average gradient is going to be reduced as well. So that means that lambda is also going to be reduced. And why? Well, if now the average is up here as opposed to down here, that means that the y-intercept has increased. Okay, we have an oscilloscope. Peak-to-peak -peak voltage in figure eight. One, two, three, four, five, six point. I'm gonna say that that is 6.4 squares. We can't go in between really. And we can see that the Y gain, in other words, the scale on the Y axis is one volt. I should probably per centimeter there. And we know that the squares are centimeters too. So I would say that that is 6.4 volts. What's interesting though is that the mark scheme says it's 6.3 volts, therefore implying that you can measure 
halfway between the lines. I don't think that's right. I think that goes against everything that we know about measuring things. What's the point in having a resolution if you can just guess where things are? Determine the frequency. So how many centimeters or squares wide is one complete wave? So let's see, one, two, three, four for half wave. So therefore it's gonna be eight centimeters for a whole wave. We're told in the diagram of the dials that the time base is 0 0.5 milliseconds per centimeter. So therefore, time period is just gonna be eight times that 0 0.5 milliseconds. So that is four milliseconds. We know that's four times 10 to the minus three seconds. We're looking for frequency. Frequency and time period are reciprocals of each other. Therefore, we're just gonna do that. And that gives us 250 Hertz. Next, we're being asked to determine the time constant from a graph. We know that time constant, let's call it TC, that's equal to RC. And that is when you get 0 0.37 or 37% of a max value or any value for that matter. So we're gonna find 37% of that peak to peak voltage. Let's use their value 6.3 times 0 0.37. That gives us a voltage left of 2.3 volts. So time taken to go from that, I'm gonna say that that is so 2.3 volts up from the bottom. I'm gonna say yes, that looks like it's pretty much bang on three little divots. So that's 0 0.6 centimeters on our scale. But we know that each one of those squares is 0 0.5 milliseconds. So therefore we're just gonna take our 0 0.6 times that by 0 0.5 and we get zero point, let's put milliseconds in there, we get 0 0.3 milliseconds, that's our time constant. So some geezer now says that setting the time base to 0 0.2 milliseconds per division, division, that's the word I was looking for, would reduce uncertainty. Advantage or disadvantage? Advantage, it's a higher resolution, therefore any measurement of time will be more accurate. However, if we make it 0 0.2, we won't be able to fit a whole wave on. We'll not display one full wave on the screen. Sure, we could measure half wave and double it, but it's always best to have one full wave. So there's no chance of you being wrong. It's always best to see the full wave in this case, just in case the charging and discharging times are slightly different. So now we have another resistor in parallel. The total resistance has decreased. So therefore, RC is also decreased. So it charges and discharges quicker. Quicker, more quickly. I never know which one is grammatically correct. So if this is our original, we know that it's going to discharge quicker and it's also going to charge quicker like that. Okay, so for this graph, we've been given a negative voltage as well. That implies that we're gonna to have to use that. So this is a really mean question if you ask me. But let's have a think about what's going on. We have the signal generator, don't we? A resistor capacitor, and the signal is going up and down as it were. Current's going that way and that way. PD's going up and down. So let's have a think. When the capacitor voltage is high, but then it starts discharging. That's because the signal has flipped. So if that's happened, then that means that the PD is going in the opposite direction. That means that the resistor is going to have a high PD, but in the opposite direction. And as time goes on, that's gonna decrease. That's not nice at all. And then when it flips again, and the capacitor now starts charging, well, the capacitor voltage goes from zero up to a maximum. And in that case, that's just your normal voltage shared across the resistor and capacitor. So that's gonna be like that. And it's gonna go down. It's doing the opposite to what the capacitor is doing. That is really mean. For question 3.1, we're being asked to find P for N equals zero. Lots of diagrams going on here, but we're just being asked where is the glider at the top? Where's the end of the glider at? And we can see that we're past 190 centimeters. And so our blown up little picture there, it goes to 8.4. So it's 190 with that 8.4 on top. So it's 198.4. 
So we're asked to find out x for all of these values. So for n equals zero, x is gonna be equal to that 198.4 take away. Where does it go to? That goes to 23.8. And that leaves us with 174.6. And then we just have to do the same for all of them going down. And then we just do the same. We take away 23.8 for all of them. And we end up with all of these numbers here. And then we're asked to find all of our log values and then plot those on the graph. 3.4, how does the graph show that x and n are exponentials? We have a straight line, therefore a linear relationship it's like this. Therefore, we can say the log x is proportional to minus n d log in both sides, we can say that x is proportional to e to the minus n. And we don't even need to go into that sort of detail according to the mask scheme. x when n is equal to 20. Of course, our graph doesn't go up to 20, so we need to find it algebraically. So just our standard straight line equation, y equals mx plus c. So therefore, we can say that for any point, y minus mx is equal to y minus mx. Therefore, we can say that y1 minus y2 is equal to m x1 minus x2. So let's swap this out for our actual variables. So we have the log of x, let's say at 20 minus another log of x is equal to the gradient times 20 minus another end that we choose. So what are we gonna put in here? Well, first of all, our gradient m, we end up with something like 0 0.135 minus that is. What values are we gonna use? Well, we might as well use n equals zero, it makes things a bit easier, because then that disappears. Log of x for that was 5.162. Okay, so next we just need to rearrange this. The log of x at 20 is equal to our minus 0 0.135 times 20 plus a 5.162, and we end up with 2.46. So log of x to the 20 is that, therefore x at 20 is equal to e to the 2.46, and that gives us 11.7 centimeters. And finally, we're just being asked, what could we do to reduce the uncertainty in the measurements of p? So first thing is when measuring, get at eye level, to track and ruler, this reduces parallax error. Always a classic one, whenever you're doing any measuring with a ruler of any kind, always try and reduce parallax error. What could we say then? Well, another classic one is obtain repeat readings to calculate mean from. So there we go, two things we could do. Hope you found that helpful. If you did, please leave a like. And if you click on the card, it'll take you to the AQA past paper playlist where you can find the other papers. See you next time.